Um, before we begin, we would like to go over a few housekeeping notes. This session is being recorded. The slides and recording of today's webinar will be provided in the follow-up communication. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions at any point of today's session. We'll be addressing these at the end of the presentation, and we will do our best to get to all of them. Okay, on behalf of Baker McKinsey and IMT Group, welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar, Asia Pacific IMT Webinar Series, Managing Customs Disputes in the Philippines. My name is Yaiko Hodaka, and I'm the co-chair of the uh, Asia Pacific Industrial Manufacturing and Transportation Industry Group of Baker McKinsey, based in Tokyo. Today's session focuses on uh, Philippines. In the previous sessions, our colleagues from other Asia Pac jurisdictions mentioned that uh, because uh, the financial condition of the governments that are badly impacted by the pandemic, they are tightening the customs audit practice. Philippine is also one of those countries. And as our speaker will ex explain later in the webinar, the customs authority in the Philippines has been very active for the past several years. Under this situation, in the worst scenario, your import operation itself may be suspended by the authority. I believe that you can learn the most updated customs audit practice in Philippine today's session. Now I'm pleased to be joined by my colleagues from Kui Sambing Tolles, member of a uh, member firm of Baker McKenzie International in Manila. First, we have Christine Ann Mercado Tamayo, who is a partner at Kui Sambing Tolles' tax practice group. She has 15 years of experience assisting and advising clients on tax issues relating to corporate restructuring and mergers and acquisitions. Christine also handles customs and international trade matters, including border and post clearance disputes. She represents clients before the Bureau of uh, Internal Revenue and the Bureau of Customs. Next three, we have Alexander Nell, who is a senior associate at Quizan Bing Torres' tax practice group. He handles tax advisory work involving various corporate transactions such as mergers and acquisitions, corporate restructuring, and other special projects. He has also worked on the tax litigation cases involving claims for refunds and assessments, and has advised clients on matters involving customs and international trade. And now I will hand it over to Kristin to kick us off with today's presentation. Thank you, Yeko. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased that we have um, quite a number of attendees today. And uh, I, take, uh, I thank you for taking time to attend this afternoon session. Again, I'm Christine, and with me for the presentation is Alex Nair. We welcome you to this webinar. Um, as in the past webinars, we hope to be able to impart uh, and share with you some important matters that we have been seeing in the recent past with respect to customs matters and particularly customs uh, disputes and customs audits. As you may know, uh, we conducted a similar webinar a few months back. We also discussed um, customs disputes and customs audits. However, for this, uh, for purposes, for purposes of this afternoon session, uh, we will still be going through the usual general discussions uh, in order to provide a backdrop of the general disc of the discussions, as well as to touch on uh, the basics, which we, we feel are equally uh, important as the major issues. But uh, the difference for this webinar is that we will be discussing uh, a number of, of case samples that we handled previously. Next slide, please. So here is the agenda for our discussions. Next slide, please. Overview of the customs audit climate. Um, why are we? Why have? Why are we uh, conducting these webinars? Because in the recent past, we've seen the customs authorities, even the Philippine tax authorities, becoming more and more aggressive in their collection efforts, and thus raising, particularly with respect to the Bureau of Customs, raising. Um, 
several issues even at the border and not just the post clearance audit. Next slide, please. Just very briefly, allow me to quickly review the importation uh, process again to provide a backdrop for the discussion. First, there is the goods uh, declaration, the filing of the goods declaration. This is based on self-assessment, i.e. the importer will be on its own, will be declaring uh, the value as well as the classification that it deems proper for the shipment. After the filing of the goods declaration, the shipment may be subject to physical examination. Note that physical examination is not uh, is not always conducted. Physical examination may be conducted where, for example, for example, by order of the Commissioner of Customs, where there is regulatory information relating to a particular shipment, where there is an alert order, um, or where the shipment is selected randomly based on the random selection standards of the customs authorities, or when the declarant or the importer himself requests the the, the physical examination of the shipment. After that, then there is the assessment. The BOZ examiners will review the goods declaration, the, the, the content of the goods declaration vis-a-vis -vis his independent determination of what he deems proper for the shipment. When everything is in order, then the goods may be may be released and the, the, the importer may just wait for, for post-clearance audit, if any. However, as you may know, um, it's not and common, it's actually very common for disputes to arise um, at the border, meaning during customs clearance and prior to uh, release of, of the shipment. The border disputes, these border disputes may, may, may arise at any stage of the importation process. At the time of filing of the goods declaration, um, under the rules, goods declaration must be filed within a certain period of days. Uh, failing to do so would may result in the abandonment of the goods, and that can give rise to uh, a whole different issue altogether. Um, examination for a jury examination where the shipment as declared by the importer in the goods declaration is different from the from the shipment as examined by by by, by the customs examiners or during assessment uh, as mentioned. Um, if the examiners believe that the value or the classification declared by the shipment are wrong, then they can file a report and issue an assessment uh, for that. There are there are there are uh, several issues that that may arise, several issues that may be raised by the customs authorities. However, more often than not, the issues at the border relate to the classification and valuation of the goods because these are the variables that affect the duties and taxes that are due to the government. So this is these are the two items that they normally look into to, to determine if, if, if the importer is paying the correct amount of taxes and also in order to generate more revenue for the government. Now, um, the law provides mechanisms to one, um, uh, next slide please, the law provides mechanisms to one, prevent or uh, at least reduce the risk of having these um, border disputes or to remedy uh, the situation. Meaning what do we do once we are already faced with these challenges from the customs authorities? Um, for, for number one, why do I say prevent or at least reduce? Because while this is, uh, while this is rare, there are times where for example, an importer has already availed of uh, these mechanisms. For example, it already has an advanced ruling classification. There are times when the Philippine Customs Authorities would still not honor that advanced ruling. However, uh, that, that's, that's rare. Um, in, in my 15 years of practice, I've only seen that happening once. So going back to the mechanisms, the mechanisms can be um, divided into two. Um, one is prior to arrival, and those are the mechanisms for prevention, and two is after arrival. So prior to arrival, um, an importer, as mentioned, an importer may secure um, an advanced ruling on classification and on valuation. What's the difference aside from the subject matter? Of course, one is classification, the other is valuation, the, the venue for the filing of these applications. An advance, an application for an advance um, valuation ruling is filed with the Bureau of Customs, particularly the Import Assessment uh, Service, while the value, the application for an advance 
um, classification ruling is filed with the Philippine uh, Tariff Commission. One note, um, the both agencies are very strict in implementing the one product rule, meaning an application per ruling, whether it is an application for advanced ruling on classification or valuation, must cover only one um, product. Now that's for prior to arrival. Now upon arrival, um, the, the law also provide for dispute uh, settlement mechanisms. In general, you have the administrative protest and also the judicial appeal. So how does this happen um, in practice? What do we watch out for? Um, as mentioned, as, as upon lodgment of the goods and before the assessment is complete, the customs officer may challenge the valuation and the classification country of origin of, of the goods. And the customs officer may raise a report, may issue a proposed uh, assessment. This may be raised um, and elevated through different offices of the Bureau of Customs to the chief of the formal entry division, to the deputy collector, and then to the district collector. And then the district collector is the one that issues the ruling if it is adverse to the importer with a directive to pay. Now, let me, let me underscore this. Let me highlight this. This ruling of the district collector is what you protest on. Um, why am I uh, emphasizing this? Because in practice, when the customs examiners raise issues, the correspondence go back and forth, usually between the customs broker of the company of the importer and the customs uh, examiners, the customs team. Um, sometimes it, it can take and it, it can it, it can take a while, uh, and sometimes you don't know anymore where the case is, where the docket is. Lodge. There are several uh, assessments being issued, handwritten, handwritten assessments being issued. Sometimes there is a tendency to miss that the district collector has already issued the ruling and directed the importer to pay. And therefore, the 15-day period within which the importer can protest that ruling has commenced. And once you miss that 15-day period, then you lose your chance to contest or refute the assessment of the district collector. So it's very important that the importer and the broker know what is already being issued, the document that is also being, that is already being released by the Bureau of Customs. And once the district collector has issued the ruling with the directive to pay, then the 15 day period commences to run. Um, when the decision of the district collector is adverse to the importer, the importer may appeal by protest to the Office of the Commissioner within um, 15 days. If uh, the decision of the commissioner is adverse to the importer, then the importer can file uh, a motion for reconsideration for another 15 days and any adverse ruling of the Commissioner of Internal Revenue in relation to the motion, consider motion for reconsideration may be um, elevated to the Court of Tax Appeals within, uh, within 30 days. Now, when there, is, um, when there is a dispute, the goods are, of course, still held under customs custody. This can be problematic because, um, one, uh, the, 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 the subject shipment may be um, indispensable for the operations of the company. For example, you're talking about shipment of raw materials or an equipment that is um, necessary for the operations of the company that, 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 that would um, allow the, the company to in turn deliver to its customers. And two, because of the costs, uh, while the, the shipment is still under custody, then of course the importer would, in, would incur um, storage, storage fee, storage costs. Now, what is the remedy of the importer? What's the remedy of the, the company? Can the goods be released? The short answer is, is yes. Uh, the importer may apply, may request for release under tentative assessment. Under the rules, uh, release under tentative assessment is allowed where there is a highly um, technical question of tariff classification, valuation, uh, rules of origin, uh, country of origin. Um, what is highly technical? For example, if the particular shipment, the item, um, does not belong to any AHTN heading or subheading, or 
it can belong to more than one AHT and tariff uh, or tariff heading or subheading, then the importer in this case may request for release under tentative assessment. What, uh, aside from filing that request for tentative assessment, as a condition precedent to the approval of, of the request for release is one, the payment of the duties and taxes as declared based on the declaration of the importer and posting of sufficient security to, um, to answer for the alleged deficiency uh, based on the assessment of the customs examiners. Now, after approval of the, of the request for release under tentative assessment, then the goods may be released to the importer. And then subsequently, the importer and the Bureau of Customs may go through the, the usual process to determine finally what is the correct valuation or the correct classification or the correct country of origin for that particular shipment. Um, when it comes to, uh, as Lancia, they, they, they go through the usual process. For example, if the issue is um, valuation, then after the release under tentative assessment, either the importer or the Bureau of Customs will refer the matter to the import assessment service to get that valuation ruling. Or if the issue is on classification, then the parties can refer the matter to the tariff, uh, tariff commission uh, for the issuance of the classification <clears throat> ruling. Um, next slide, please. Seizure and forfeiture proceedings. Unfortunately, we see this happen more often than we want to, especially in, 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 in recent months. Um, what happens? How, does, how is this commenced? How would you know that uh, a border dispute can ripen into a seizure forfeiture proceedings? Any of the issues, uh, any of the uh, any of the border disputes may ripen into this type of proceedings, into seizure and forfeiture proceedings. Um, but in recent months, the most common are um, lack of permit because of uh, being an unlawful importation, or importation of prohibited importations, or if there is an alleged deficiency of more than thirty percent. So for example, if the question is on classification or valuation, and there is an alleged discrepancy of more than 30%, the customs examiner can issue a report or recommend to the district collector the issuance of a warrant of seizure and detention or the WSD. So that is how a border, uh, that is how seizure and uh, forfeiture proceedings start. The customs examiner would recommend the issuance of the WSD for the district collector to issue that warrant of seizure and detention. When the district collector um, receives that report from the customs examiner, it will have to determine whether there is probable cause that the district collector does not uh, immediately issue the WSD. It will have to determine whether there is probable cause for the issuance of the WSD. Um, can the district collector uh, can the district collector release the goods? The answer is yes, um, under certain grounds. For example, the goods are not prohibited, the necessary permits or licenses are presented, or if the release of the goods is not contrary, contrary, contrary to law. However, these grounds must, of course, be uh, substantiated. For example, what is contrary to law? That is also a legal question that must be threshed out so, so the tendency of the district collector really is to proceed with the case and to issue the warrant of seizure and detention. After the warrant of seizure and detention is issued, the docket that the case will be referred to the law division uh, of the Bureau of Customs and will assign the district collector, will assign a hearing officer and the hearing officer will set um, the hearing, the hearing date, and we go through the, the hearing process. Now, the parties file the position paper, comment to the position paper, reply to comment, uh, all the pleadings. Um, these are all in the rules. However, what I believe is important is um, to, to, to share what we, we, we normally see during these proceedings. First, um, we, it, it is important that we um, strictly follow the rules to the letter. As, as much as possible, we recommend taking a conservative position when it comes to interpreting vague or conflicting rules. Why? While, while the BOC is, uh, is not very strict when it comes to procedural um, matters, we, of course, don't want to 
um, heavily rely on this uh, leniency because at the end of the day, ultimately, um, uh, failure to comply with the procedural matters may be taken against us. And, and so we don't want, of course, to, 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 to lose on, on technical grounds. Also, another, another point in relation to the conduct of the seizure and forfeiture proceedings, the, the rules are not very clear on, uh, on the time period within which the district collector must uh, resolve the case, must decide the case. Um, but uh, as a remedy, of course, the, the longer that it takes, more costs to the, to the company, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the importer would then have option to file a motion to resolve. And more often than not, uh, the district collector acts on these motions to resolve. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, suspension of importer accreditation. Unfortunately, um, we have been seeing this uh, quite often. In case of seizure and forfeiture proceedings, almost automatically, the BOC suspends the accreditation of the importer. Consequently, the importer will not be able to engage in any import transactions. And this can, this can significantly affect the, uh, the operations of, of the company. Um, in our discussions with one of the deputy commissioners of the Bureau of Customs a few months back, he confirmed that they are really doing this now, even for seemingly minor violations, not just for not just in relation to seizure and forfeiture proceedings, in order to force importers to to comply and to engage them. Because uh, according to him, previously, um, even where there, for example even when there is a seizure and forfeiture proceedings, sometimes the importer just would just um, forget about it and would not engage in the proceedings uh, and would just let the, the, the shipment go. Now, now that the Bureau of Customs is implementing the suspension of importer accreditation um, while the proceedings is ongoing, then the importers are, are forced to engage and, and, and the deputy commissioner confirmed that that is the reason why they have been um, doing that. In one case, for example, the BOC, uh, without notice, suspended import accreditation of a company, of, of a client, because of um, alleged repeated requests for the lifting of abandonment. Um, as, as some of you may know, that's actually provided under, under the rules. Uh, an importer may request for the lifting of abandonment under, under certain grounds. But in this case, because of um, repeated requests filed by the importer, the Bureau of Customs, without notice, canceled the importer accreditation of the client. Now, what is the remedy of the importer when this happens? Um, there is uh, the, the importer may file a request for continuous processing. Um, this will cover shipments of the importer that have arrived, um, but not yet cleared and not yet released from customs custody at the time that the importer accreditation was suspended, was cut, um, and shipments that are in transit uh, when the importer accreditation was suspended. Um, this will not cover and the Bureau of Customs will not process requests for continuous processing for shipments that left origin after the, the, after the importer accreditation has been um, suspended. Next slide, please. Um, in seizure and forfeiture proceedings, uh, while it is ongoing, the, the rules also provide other remedies for the importer. The, the importer um, is not, is not uh, constrained to, to, to finish the whole proceedings. Um, in the middle of the proceedings, the importer may file an offer uh, of settlement. There are two ways. Um, the offer to settle by payment of fine or settlement by, by redemption. What's the difference? Um, first, the difference lies on when you are when 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 the importer has to file this. When it is settlement by file uh, by fine, this is filed um, before the district collector issues 
uh, the decision on the seizure and forfeiture case. Um, and the importer, once approved, the importer needs to pay only 30% as penalty. Of course, in addition to the duties and taxes that are due, a penalty equal to 30% of the landed cost. Settlement by, settlement by redemption is done after the district collector issues its ruling already and while the case is on appeal to the office of the commissioner. Um, it's settlement by redemption because at, after the district collector decides on the case and, and rules um, adverse to the importer, then the, the goods are actually considered forfeited already in favor of the government. So the option of the importer is to redeem it by offering to pay uh, the fine equivalent to 100% of the total landed cost, because as, as mentioned, the, the, the goods are already considered forfeited in, for, uh, in favor of the government. So any decision, if, for example, there is a decision adverse, the district collector decides um, adverse to the importer, the importer may appeal to the commissioner, and the decision of the commissioner may be appealed to the, to the court of tax appeals. If the decision of the district collector is adverse to the government, then that is um, subject to automatic review by the Commissioner of Customs, or if the decision of the Commissioner of Customs is adverse to the government, then that is subject to automatic review by the um, Secretary of, of Finance. Um, Alex, over to you. Thank you, Christine. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. So um, I am Alex from uh, the Tax Practice Group of um, Kisumbing Torres. So while Christine's presentation uh, focused on the disputes at the border, uh, my presentation will cover um, the post-clearance audit. So why does the Bureau of Customs um, has a post-clearance audit? Um, the, the purpose of this is to facilitate um, trade by allowing low risk or um, low risk importations to be cleared um, immediately based on self-declaration of the importers and at the same time giving the Bureau of Customs an opportunity to review the records of the importer and if the declarations are correct, there are any deficiencies um, post um, entry or post clearance of the goods. Because imagine if um, each and every package will have to be thoroughly examined by the Bureau of Customs. Uh, there will be um, significant delays in the clearance process of the um, goods. So my presentation will uh, briefly cover the audit procedure, the common issues raised, and the remedies of the importer. So the government agency mandated to um, conduct um, audit investigation of importers and um, other parties engaged in customs clearance, um, such as the brokers, is the post-clearance audit group. Um, this was recently formed back in October 2017 because um, to towards the end of 2013, the uh, post-clearance or post-entry audit functions of the Bureau of Customs uh, were transferred uh, directly under the Department of Finance. However, for several years, the Fiscal Intelligence Unit handling the post-clearance functions um, was not very efficient. Um, nothing much happened during that time. So back in 2017, um, the post-clearance functions um, returned to the Bureau of Customs. So for the procedure, um, as you may know, um, the, the Philippine Tax Authority has um, three years within which to issue a deficiency assessment from the date of the filing of the tax return. So similarly, the Customs Authority also has three years from the date of final payment of tax and duties within which to uh, conduct an investigation and issue a deficiency assessment. So the date of final payment of taxes and duties is when the all charges have been paid and the Bureau of Customs has granted legal permit for the goods to be withdrawn. Um, the selection process um, depends on several factors, but uh, this includes the 
volume of importation of the company, um, the rates of duties of the commodities in being imported by the company, and of course, the track record on the compliance with the rules of a particular importer. Because if an importer has been um, frequently violating customs rules, then it is highly likely that it will be selected for uh, a customs audit investigation. Um, before the uh, under the old rules, there's a pre-audit conference where um, the post-clearance group will discuss the purpose and scope of the audit, the duration, the specific date, and um, the documents will be reviewed. But um, to expedite um, the process, this has, has already been removed. So once the audit notification letter has been issued by the Customs Authority, um, the audit must commence within 60 days and must be completed within 120 days. So here are some of the common issues raised uh, during the audit investigation. Uh, these issues are very similar to what uh, Christine discussed earlier um, on the disputes at the border. So um, there's classification, valuation, um, entitlement to preferential rates or exemption under a particular free trade agreement, and uh, record keeping of the importer. So one of the common issues is classification. Um, as you may know, each, each commodity has an signed HS code under the tariff book, um, which is corresponding duty rate. And the incorrect use of um, an HS code may result uh, in a deficiency assessment as duty rates uh, largely vary depending on the type of product. So um, as we will discuss later on in the case studies, um, we will highlight the importance of uh, using the correct uh, HS code and uh, securing a, a tariff classification ruling. Um, as Christine has also discussed earlier, um, to minimize the risk of a uh, deficiency assessment or the, the BOC, the Bureau of Customs contesting the classification used by the importer, the importer may secure a tariff commission tariff classification ruling from the tariff commission. Uh, while this ruling is issued by the tariff commission, it is binding upon the Bureau of Customs unless it is reversed by the Secretary of Finance. Um, another issue is uh, the valuation. Um, the Philippine customs laws follow a sequential application of valuation methods but the primary method is the transaction value, which is the price actually paid by the importer to the supplier, including all costs and other charges and adjustments such as um, royalties. Um, another uh, possible issue that may be raised is uh, the transfer pricing documentation, especially when um, the importer and the supplier are related parties. Sometimes the BOC will question the, the transaction value used by the importer, um, especially if the especially when the BOC has some um, gathered data um, with respect to pricing uh, on the industry uh, with respect to that particular uh, or specific um, commodity. So similar to classification. Um, importers may also secure an advanced valuation ruling. Um, this particular ruling is um, um, being issued by the Bureau of Customs. So this will at least minimize the risk of the BOC having to contest um, the transaction value declared by the um, importer during an audit investigation. Uh, for record keeping, um, the documents are uh, usually um, being reviewed by the audit team of the customs is the of course the single administrative document or the import entry certificates of origin um, this is important especially if um, the importer um, availed of preferential treaty rates or exemption under a free trade agreement as you may know um, some of the commodities 
are subject to 0% duty or even a lower duty rate under a particular free trade agreement. But um, of course, this is subject to the compliance or satisfaction of the conditions laid down by the particular free trade agreement. So the certificate of origin will um, contain the um, co components of the commodity and um, the audit team should be able to verify based on the certificate of origin whether um, it qualifies under the free trade agreement. So um, to give you an illustration of how um, there's being applied to actual cases, we will um, discuss a few um, case studies, uh, actual cases. So the first case study will be discussed by Christine. Over to you, Christine. Thanks, Alex. So for this, uh, for the first case, this um, the issue is what is the correct uh, dutyable value. As you may know, the, the, the law provides that uh, generally, it shall be the it's the transaction value. It is the price actually paid or payable. But what is uh, the price actually paid or payable? So in this case, um, company A imported uh, some items with a total contract value of fifty thousand US dollars. Um, then f company A used the contract price. Uh, for purposes of its uh, declaration with the with the customs authorities upon importation, but then three months later, um, company B, the the supplier or the seller, uh, requested a, a retroactive price hike and added, uh, for example, two thousand US dollars on top of the contract price. So upon 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 audit, uh, next slide please, Alex. Um, during post clearance audit, the when the BOC sees that there is a retroactive uh, price hike, then the BOC would consider the additional, in this case, two thousand US dollars, for purposes of determining the correct duties and taxes due on the um, importation. Next slide, please. Um, case two. This relates to um, adjustments adjustments to the um, contract price to arrive at the correct uh, dutyable value. So in this case, um, company M in the Philippines ordered uh, raw materials from company L from offshore. The total contract price was, uh, for example, 200,000 US dollars. And the import declaration with that contract price was accepted by the Bureau of Customs at the time of uh, the time of importation, and the goods were released. However, um, during investigation, during the post clearance audit, the, the Bureau of Customs uh, noted that during the importation process, um, Company L uh, ordered another entity, Company Q, from another company to ship the raw materials to to the importer in the Philippines to Company M. Uh, upon verification, the, the Bureau of Customs noted that the, the, the amount the, the, the amount paid for that transportation cost was actually paid by Company M to Company L as part of their agreement for, for the goods ordered by Company M. So during post-clearance audit, the Bureau of Customs took the position that the additional cost for the transportation, that the, the transportation handling cost should be added to the contract price to form part of the dutyable value. Case three, Alex. Next slide, please. Oh, case three proceeds again adjustments to the to the value. In this case, um, company A in the Philippines uh, imported chemical products and markets the chemical product. So um, company A pays uh, the, the invoice value to company B. However, subsequent to the importation, company P on an annual basis uh, pays um, company B uh, an additional 5% of uh, net sales as part of their pricing agreement, their pricing arrangement. So during post-clearance audit, the BOC took the position that the 5% um, additional, 5% of net sales in addition to what, uh, to what company A paid at, at the time of importation must be considered for purposes of determining the dutyable value 
of the of the of the goods. Next slide, please. Um, case four involves in a documentation. So in this case, um, company A purchase products from company B, for example, for a total contract price of 100,000 US dollars, but then company B sourced that from company C, for example, for, for a contract price of 80,000 US dollars. Now, in this arrangement, company C directly uh, delivered the goods to company A in the Philippines. And during the importation, company A only presented the manufacturer's invoice, the invoice issued by company C for 80,000 US dollars. In this case, um, there are two sales, as you may note, the sale between A and B and the sale between B and C. Under the rules, the dutiable value shall be the value um, at the time of the last sale prior to the entry of the goods into the Philippines. So the dutiable value here should be the sale between company A and, and company B and, and, should be, and that invoice should be used for um, customs clearance and not the manufacturer's invoice for a lesser, uh, for a lesser value. Over to you, Alex. Thank you, Christine. So case number five involves um, royalties paid as a condition of the sale. Um, under Philippine customs laws, there, there's an explicit provision under our Customs Modernization and Tariff Act, which states that um, royalties paid as a condition of the sale to the supplier um, should be included as an adjustment uh, in the transaction value. Now, now the, the purpose of this is to uh, avoid um, the importers are artificially lowering the tax base so that the customs authority will be able to capture um, all the payments made by the importer to the supplier. So, so in this case, the importer um, is a distributor of consumer goods. Uh, they imported $100,000 worth of um, consumer goods. And then the importer and the supplier has an existing royalty agreement uh, in which uh, in the agreement it states that um, the importer has to pay um, royalties equivalent to 5% of the sales and remit it to the supplier, I think, um, within a period of 30 or 45 days from um, approval of the sales. Um, so in this case, upon importation, um, the importer only used the $100,000 um, declared value as the tax base for the duties and the VAT. However, upon um, investigation during the audit, um, the BOC um, explained to the importer that uh, under our customs laws, any royalties paid to the supplier, which is a condition of the sale, um, should be included as part of the tax base. So in this case, the importer was assessed um, additional duties and import VAT um, based on the 5% um, royalty payments to the supplier. Um, case number six um, involves an incorrect use of uh, the HS code. So in this case, the importer is a distributor of um, consumer goods, including instant coffee. So it imported um, coffee powder mix, but used a different um, HS code with a duty rate of 10% instead of the HS code specifically assigned to the instant coffee mix. There's a specific label under our tariff book that's assigned to instant coffee, which is a much higher um, duty rate of 40%. Now, in this case, the importer is claiming that, um, look, uh, this coffee powder mix still has to undergo a process in order to meet our standards. So for us, it's not yet the instant coffee mix that's um, referred to under uh, our um, tariff book. But the customs authority is insisting that um, if you mix, you make um, powder with water and will result in a drinkable instant coffee, then regardless of your standards, it should be considered an instant coffee mix, um, which should be 
under the specific HS code um, with a duty rate of 40%. So because of the dispute between the, between the um, customs authority and the importer, the customs authority heard a tariff ruling from the tariff commission and unfortunately, the Tariff Commission ruled in favor of the Customs Authority and stated that um, the, the product imported by the importer should already uh, be considered as an instant coffee mix, um, regardless of the process that it has to undergo to meet the standards of the importer. So in this case, the um, importer was assessed efficiency duty and the importer that. So now we go to the um, rates of penalties. Under the old tariff and customs code, um, the rates of penalties have ranges, but now it has been simplified under the Customs Modernization and Tariff Act. So for um, simple negligence or inadvertent error, which refers to a mechanical or clerical error unintentionally committed by the importer, the penalty is only 10% of the revenue loss to the government. Uh, in case there's negligence uh, based on the findings of the audit team, um, the penalty is 125%. Now, negligence um, refers to the failure of the importer to exercise reasonable care um, in their declarations. And lastly, if there's a fraud, uh, which is um, an intentional commission of any act uh, resulting in a material um, false statement to reduce or avoid um, the payment of duties and taxes, the penalty is 600% of the revenue loss of the government. Um, prior to the enactment of the CMTA, um, the BOC, the Bureau of Customs does not impose interest on deficiency duties and taxes, but now the rules have been revised and uh, now impose an interest of 20%. So in case of a deficiency assessment, uh, the importer still has a remedy. So upon receipt of the deficiency assessment by the post-clearance audit group, it can file a protest um, within 15 days from receipt of the demand letter. And then upon the filing of the protest, um, the importer has 30 days within which to submit its um, supporting documents um, to support its position. In case the protest is still denied by the customs authority, the importer can file a request for reconsideration with the office of the commissioner. Um, and in case the decision of the commissioner is still adverse to the importer, um, the final remedy of the importer is to file an appeal, a judicial appeal with the Court of Tax Appeals. Um, this is filed within 30 days from receipt of the decision of the Commissioner of Customs. Now, another remedy by the importer is um, by availing of the Voluntary Disclosure Program of the Bureau of Customs. So, um, uh, the Voluntary Disclosure Program provides an opportunity to importers to um, disclose errors and voluntarily pay deficiency taxes based on their findings, um, based on their self-assessment or internal audit. Um, uh, under the rules, the importer must submit an application uh, disclosing the errors and the amounts and tender the payment of um, the deficiency duties as found by their based on their self-assessment. Now, um, under the old rules, once an audit notice has been issued to an importer, uh, that importer may no longer um, avail of the voluntary disclosure. But under the revised rules, um, the importer may still um, file an application for voluntary disclosure as long as it is within 60 days from receipt of the audit notice. Now, not all um, cases uh, may be covered by the voluntary disclosure application. So the cases excluded are those uh, subject of a pending case with uh, another office at the Bureau of Customs, those cases already filed in courts, and those cases involving fraud. 
So uh, the, the benefits of um, an approved voluntary disclosure application is a lower penalty. So in this case, um, the deficiency duties and taxes will only be subject to a 5% as opposed to 125% uh, in case of negligence. Um, but if the voluntary disclosure application is filed after receipt of the audit notice, then the penalty is 10%. But it's still way lower than the 125% um, penalty imposed during an audit um, as a result of agency findings by the audit team of the customs. Okay, so that concludes our um, presentation. Um, Christine, we can move yeah. on to the Q&A portion. Sure, Alex. There are um, a number of questions from the participants. First, um, could you please clarify the purpose of the bond with regard to the movement of equipment from the echo zones? How does the bond requirement relate to VAT and duties? Does the BOC stand on a solid ground from a law perspective with their regard to their firm requirement of the payment of 12% VAT prior to the deployment, farm out of equipment for work from home use? What is your recommended approach in dealing with this kind of dispute with the BOC where there are conflicting views? Um, the first, the answer is the, I, before before answering this question, just to provide a backdrop. Um, as you may know, the echo zone is considered by fiction of law outside Philippine customs territory, and that is where. Uh, that is the reason for, for the issue with respect to the imposition of VAT and duties. Why is the Bureau of Customs um, requiring the posting of a bond for the deployment of equipment, for example, laptops from the echo zone for work from home use outside the echo zone? It is because um, presumably the assumption is that when these assets, for example, laptops were uh, brought into the zone, for example, if they were imported from offshore, the echo zone, the, 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 the registered business enterprise located within the echo zone, availed of tax and duty free, uh, tax availed of the tax and duty free incentive with respect to their importations because of their registration with investment promotions agency, for example, the Philippine Economic Zone Authority. Precisely because the echo zone is treated as a territory separate from the Philippine customs territory. Therefore, once these assets are brought out of the zone subsequently, they are considered under the law as having been technically imported. So there is technical importation there. Um, hence, duties and taxes may be imposed on the movement of the assets from the echo zone to the Philippine Customs Territory. And that is why uh, the Bureau of Customs is requiring um, posting of the bond security uh, to ensure that the duties and taxes on the supposed technical importation of the assets uh, will be covered uh, by the bond. And that is, um, that is uh, categorically uh, provided under the, under the law. Um, I understand that uh, I understand that there are there are we, we have been dealing with quite a number of disputes with the Bureau of Customs when it comes to, for example, valuation of assets moving in and out of the zone. Um, previously, prior to the work from home issue that we are we are experiencing now, we are encountering now, the BOC would try to assess the duties and taxes on the acquisition cost on the historical cost of these assets, which is wrong. Um, under the law, it should be the book value of the assets. However, in practice, unfortunately, um, the BOC is not following this. The, the, the good news is recently, they have, uh, they have allowed certain discounts, 70% discount or 50% discount on, from the historical cost, and they impose the duties and taxes there. Um, again, that is not in accordance, that is not aligned with what's provided under the rules, under the law. It should be the net book value. Um, but then again, again uh, in, in practice, that is not really being followed now by the Bureau of Customs station at the, at the, at the PESA. 
Um, another question is, for voluntary disclosure, can importers still file an application for voluntary disclosure on importations not covered by the current audit notice? Um, Alex, maybe you, you, you can take this. Yes, um, this is similar to the um, issuance of a letter of authority by the tax authority. Um, usually, the uh, audit notification letter has a specific um, period covered by the by the audit. So, if for example, the audit will the, the scope of the audit will cover um, importations of only up to um, taxable year twenty twenty, then. Uh, importations made from 2021 and onwards may still be subject of a voluntary disclosure application. Um, another question here, um, with respect to valuation ruling, um, what if the importer has um, a, lo a lot of products? Uh, um, since the valuation rule, one application for valuation ruling should only cover um, a single product or commodity. Um, what could be the possible remedy um, to, to address this um, issue? Um, yeah, I, I can take that, Alex. Um, as mentioned earlier, under the rules, the application for valuation ruling or classification ruling must only cover one product, one SKU. Um, but uh, but but uh, you're right, that can be can, that can be problematic in certain cases. For example, in one case that we are actually currently uh, handling, um, the, the importer, the, the company is engaged in the business of distributing a particular gadget. Now they also import spare parts to replace uh, the spare parts of the gadget that they distribute to their customers. Now they are applying for, for a valuation ruling for a thousand, uh, thousands of spare parts. We are initially, the Bureau of Customs questioned uh, the application for covering more than just one product because we are talking about thousands of spare parts. And now we are in discussions with the Bureau of Customs. If we can proceed with the application for the valuation ruling based on product family, because we explained that it can be uh, too cumbersome for the importer to actually file too cumbersome for the importer as well as to the Bureau of Customs to actually process thousands of applications for valuation ruling, where we are just really talking about evaluation. It's not like our, our, our argument is that this is not the same as, for example, a tariff classification ruling, where a particular item would really have uh, just one tariff heading, would really belong to a tariff heading. This one is uh, a valuation ruling that 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 is um, that is uh, dependent on, for example, the, the commercial transaction between the parties. And we are arguing that uh, um, despite what's provided under the rules, then maybe they can um, they can accommodate this uh, from from a practical perspective that they can uh, process the application for valuation ruling based on product family. Um, this has not. So far, they, 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 we have not received any negative um, feedback from the Bureau of Customs. It's still being processed. So um, I am hoping that uh, this will, this will the, the, that, that solution would resolve the issue. Um, Alex, there's another question. I think you can also take this. For audit documentation, are copies uh, acceptable or the examiners strict on presentation of originals? Oh uh, well, based on our experience, and as also mentioned by Christine earlier, um, in during her presentation, the customs examiners are um less strict or more lenient when it comes to documentation. So usually, um, they, they will accept copies of the um importation documents. Um, however, when the case uh, reaches the courts, um, as you may all know, courts are very strict when it comes to documentation because um, the case will now be subject to the rules of procedure and the rules of, of evidence. So um, it is also important to um, keep the originals of the documents in case um, 
the, the particular assessment will have to be appealed to the courts. Yeah, yeah we are running out of time. We'll just, um, we'll just uh, um, answer just one more question. And I, I think this one last question is very, very um, important and very common. Um, when an importer accreditation is suspended, can uh, forwarders in, uh, import on behalf of importers? Um, this is, I think that as mentioned, it is very important because we know that this is being done, commonly being done in practice, uh, but the short answer to that question is no. Um, the, the forwarders, freight forwarders cannot import or use its own importer accreditation privileges for purposes of importing the items, the shipments of their of their clients. If, for example, a, a freight forwarder will be in the picture, the importer himself would have to be uh, accredited with the Bureau of Customs as well. And the, the because the Bureau of Customs recognizes that this is a prevalent practice. Uh, in a, a few years back, the, the Bureau of Customs issued an internal memorandum uh, providing specifically that this practice is is um, not allowed. This is considered as misuse of importer accreditation privileges by the freight forwarders. So this may impact definitely the importer accreditation of the freight forwarder and the uh, importer as well. For example, if the suspension is because of an alleged uh, violation of the of the customs code, then this might aggravate the situation of the importer. So uh, that concludes uh, this afternoon's uh, session. Thank you uh, very much for, for attending the uh, for attending the session. Thank you for your time. Um, over to you, Yeko. Okay, um, thank you very much, Christine and Alex. On behalf of Baker McKenzie and uh, the IMT group, uh, thank you for joining today's webinar. We would appreciate your feedback through a short survey, please just click on the link appealing on your screen as you close the window. Please join me in thanking our speakers, Kristin and Alex, for an excellent discussion on customs audit and disputes in the Philippines. We hope that you found this session informative and relevant for your organization's operations. For more information, or if you would like to discuss further, please do reach out to either of them. The next session in this series will focus on the United States to which many Asian countries uh, companies are exporting goods uh, that, that will take place in September. Uh, the details of the seminar to be sent in due course. We look forward to having you there. Goodbye for now and have a great rest of the day ahead. Thank you, bye-bye. <laughs>